Dr. Nzlapo, we can start. Thank you, Renir. Good evening, everyone. And a warm welcome to the first summer webinar for the year 2022. Tonight's session is the first of a two-part webinar series. The second session will be run at the same time on the 17th of February, 2022. The topic for these two sessions is, in my view, a critical, relevant, and a timely one that deals directly with the primary care management of COVID-19. There are two major issues which make this webinar significant. Firstly, we have assembled an excellent and a highly rated panel of speakers. And secondly, we are looking at the latest evidence-based data, which is backed by case studies. I am sure that all colleagues here, you'll agree that these are two factors that are important to ensuring the credibility of the information that we are about to hear. Our objective with these webinars is to improve the quality of care for mild to moderate cases of COVID-19. We are looking at doing this through examining evidence-based management of COVID-19, through encouraging a pragmatic approach to care, including of high-risk patients and promoting ongoing critical appraisal skills. It is my great privilege this evening to introduce the moderator of tonight's session, Dr. Norbert Njekam. He is the National Director for Drug-Resistant Tuberculosis Care at the National Department of Health. A little bit about Dr. Njeka. Dr. Njeka's vision for TB management in South Africa is to strengthen the programmatic and clinical management of drug-resistant tuberculosis, an approach which has already started paying off as there has been a decline in the number of drug-resistant tuberculosis cases during his term of office. It must also be noted that under Dr. Njeka's leadership, there has been a remarkable improvement in the proportion of patients who have been successfully, successfully treated for drug-resistant tuberculosis. In addition to his role at the National Department of Health, Dr. Njeka is currently the chairperson of the African Green Light Committee that advises the World Health Organization on how to manage drug-resistant tuberculosis. He recently received an honorary doctorate from the University of Cape, Cape Town, recognizing his outstanding contribution to the fight against drug-resistant tuberculosis, not only locally, but globally as well. It is therefore my great honor to hand over to Dr. Njeka to continue with these evening's proceedings. Dr. Njega, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nkapo. Uh, in fact, uh, I must apologize. After sending you uh, my bio, um, two days ago, I got uh, redeployed uh, to new functions as the chief director for TV program. So I think, uh, um between today and myself, we, we, we forgot we're just busy people. Uh, but it's, that's what it is. Otherwise, uh, I'm humbled by your, your introduction. And I'm going to introduce the capable panelists uh, that we have for, for the day, uh, for, for the evening, actually. And uh, we, we do have... Uh, uh, rightfully so, as you said, uh, Dr. Anklapo, uh, very capable uh, men and women who are going to take us through uh, the, the session uh, this evening. And the first one is uh, Professor Megan Naidu, uh, who is the head of uh, family medicine at Wentworth, you know, uh, Wentworth Hospital. Uh, is an associate professor at University of KZN, di director of uh, SAMA, and chair of the MCQ, Multiple Choice Committee, in the College of uh, Family Physicians. The next one is uh, uh, Professor, is Dr. 
Jeremy Nell. Nell has been a regular into uh, webinars around COVID, and he is um, the infectious disease specialist at Vet University. He works at Helen Joseph Hospital. Uh, is involved with postgrad and undergrad training, and also is involved with uh, research. Uh, is uh, a national principal investigator for two large multinational COVID therapeutics uh, trials. He's also a member of uh, advisory ministerial advisory committee on COVID. Uh, very, very busy uh, gentleman. The, the third one is Professor Jenny Clute, who's a, a consultant pediatrician at University of Pretoria based at Steve Biko uh, Hospital. She also has uh, a research project around COVID, looking at prevalence, clinical characteristics, immunologic responses and outcomes of children with suspected or confirmed COVID. 19 disease and the impact and outcomes of uh, the pandemic on maternal and child health in Trinity District of South Africa. A very important uh, study project uh, that she's uh, dealing with there. And uh, we also have Professor Andy Parrish, who is the current chair of uh, uh, NEMLEC Ministerial Advisory Committee on COVID and the co-chair of NEMLEC. Uh, previous chair of adult hospital level EML, uh, Essential Medicine List Committee. Uh, he works, uh, he serves in the, uh, in the Eastern Cape and his current research interests include rational prescribing, clinical audit and clinical communication, very, very important. And our last panelist is Professor Tamara Credo, who's a specialist in clinical pharmacology uh, she holds a position of senior specialist scientist at Cochrane, uh, South Africa, a medical research council. She has special interest in evidence-based healthcare practice and training rational therapeutics and clinical practice guidelines. She's involved with work about quality and content of clinical practice guidelines in uh, Southern Africa. She's also a member of NEMLEC Ministerial Advisory Committee um, uh, for therapeutics, conducting reviews on various COVID treatment, informing national guidelines for South African Department of Health. We are a evidence-based uh, 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 department, and that is why we are really um, very happy to welcome this panel that will take you through uh, what we've prepared for the evening. Uh, but before... Um, the case studies that were prepared. I'm going to ask Professor Andy Parrish uh, to give us a, a quick overview in terms of the guidelines and the evidence base that has been prepared that will be discussed later. Over to you, Professor Andy Parrish. Oh, thanks, Dr. Njeka. I'm not going to take much time away from the presentations because I think that's where we're going, but I'm delighted to be part of this panel and I hope we can um, sort of move forward in terms of linking up evidence between the um, processes going on in the private sector and the public sector in South Africa. So it's quite exciting that we're having this sort of meeting. Um, the, the, the theme of what I'm interested in is the variations in practice that have come up with COVID. It's been quite fascinating watching how fast new information has come in and how people are doing things differently, both in um, hospitals and at community level, and also between state and private. And such wide variation often means that not all of those solutions are optimum. So it is interesting to look at which, how we decide um, which route to go and where the evidence is. Um, there's often an imbalance between assessing be uh, benefits and harm. And again, looking at the evidence can make it quite easy really to sort these things out or at least give some perspectives on it. So again, looking um, where the evidence is um, is a good place to start with all these things. And I hope that theme will come through in the, in the presentations you'll see today. The problem with information sources during an epidemic is that they've really proliferated and it was quite difficult because they weren't all of equal quality. Some of the early ones um, came from eminent groups, 
were propagated virally on social media. And it becomes quite difficult for practitioners to balance all this discordant information from various sources. So really what we're appealing to is looking at this issue around the public sector and where NHI is going to fit in in the future and looking forward in terms of linking the public and the private sector in terms of reliable evidence-based um, recommendations um, based on um, relatively high quality guidelines. And one of the things that we should be looking at is assessing the quality of the guidelines and being prepared to accept that sometimes information changes and can be wrong and need to change our practices. So during the presentations, really what we're asking you is look at the recommendations and um, are there discordances between what is recommended here and what you're doing? Um, if not, um, how does one decide who's right? And um, you know, is the evidence quality sufficient to make a call on this? Is the guideline quality sufficient? And finally, are there any barriers to change in practice? So essentially what we're saying is let's look at the data behind this, the, the recommendations rather than just um, taking them simply because they come from a reputable source. So on that, um, you know, I've just put a bit of a plug for EBM, but I think we can now move back to you, Dr. Njeg. All right, thank you so much, uh, Professor Andy Parish. So uh, colleagues, we, we're going to take our first presenter, uh, Professor Megan Naidu, uh, who will do the first uh, cases. Please um, put your questions on the Q&A chat if you have any, and um, we shall respond uh, to, to, to your questions, if any. But I'll hand over to Prof Naidu uh, to take us to the first uh, case study. Over to you, Prof Naidu. Uh, thank you, Dr. Njeka, and thank you for inviting me to present on this platform. So two, two years about, uh, just under two years ago, we were faced with this pandemic, and I think lots of us winged it because there was just no evidence available at the time when it came to managing COVID-19. And through the process of the last two years, we've actually refined our approaches to managing COVID-19. And a lot of what we do is actually based on evidence. So what we're gonna to do today is just do a case management of an outpatient, and then we're gonna go through evidence review. So the focus is also on looking at evidence and how you use evidence and how you critically appraise evidence. So the case is a 45 year old male patient known with hypertension and diabetes, who presents for his routine six month monthly follow-up. The, the screening test done reveals that he has a fever, sore throat and body pains. So what should you do? So in our setting, we have a screening tool that we've also refined as the pandemic has evolved. And we've included some of the symptoms that seems to be more unique to Omicron than say the earlier versions of the, of the virus so that we've included in, in, in our screening tool. We've also did assessment of risk in our screening tool, which actually helps us to identify those patients most vulnerable for severe disease. And we've included also how, if the patient has been vaccinated or not, because this is an opportunity for us to promote health and actually vaccinate those that are, haven't been vaccinated. So the WHO has got uh, a tool by which you can assess patients and, and actually judge whether they have a probability of having COVID-19 using this probability rating that they have. And these we all know, it's basically based on the symptoms, uh, the epidemi epidemiological criteria, uh, whether the patient has an acute respiratory illness, whether the patient has been in contact, what the chest X-ray findings are showing you, and whether there's evidence of loss of taste or smell, which we found to be a pretty specific uh, symptoms when it comes to, to COVID-19. So he's seen in the, in the dedicated COVID-19 area in your rooms. He was noted to be, first of all, unvaccinated. His vital signs were, so AFPUs, alert, verbal, pain, or unresponsive, so he was alert. His respiratory rate was 18. His pulse rate was 96, his SATs was 96%, his blood pressure was 138 over 78, his blood sugar was 11.5, that's a random blood sugar, his weight was 98, 92 kgs and his BMI was noted to be 32, he had a temperature of 37.8 and his rapid antigen test done in the rooms was positive. 
So this is option. So I'd like you to invite you to take part in this short poll. Ranir will project this poll onto your screens. So please choose one of the options from the poll and we'll allow a few seconds for that to run. So you've got uh, prescribed inhaled budesonide, prescribed ivermectin, prescribed oral steroids, prescribed vitamins, treat symptomatically or all of the above. I don't really, as somebody who chairs the MCQ committee, I don't really like choosing all of the above, but, um, but there it is. So we'll just give you a few seconds. So 10 seconds more, please make your choice. And Ranir, I think end the poll and let's show, see the results. Thank you for voting. Okay, so 82% of people said treat symptomatically, but there's a, there's a split of, well, actually this would be considered a, a good MCQ because we have distractors for, for almost every item. So, uh, well, that's actually good when you said MCQs, but 82% uh, of, of the audience actually choose treat symptomatically. So let's go through the evidence. So we have this triage tool available in our now flu clinic where we identify patients based on severity. And if the systolic blood pressure is less than 100, the respiratory rate is more than 24, the SATs are less than 95%, the heart rate is more than 120, or the mental status is not A, once any our, our clinical nurse practitioner or doctor working in the clinic identifies this patient as having any of those symptoms or signs, they are then immediately sent to our, our emergency, emergency room. So we have this from the Department of Health in terms of the management of COVID-19, which talks about how to assess, which I've just covered, in terms of the, the vital signs, what guidance you should give to your patient who needs to self-isolate. And I think there's, there's probably gonna be a, a circular sent out by the Department of Health on the optimal times for, for, of days for isolation. And if you notice the, 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 the statement from the presidency saying that the isolation period has been re reduced to seven days for symptomatic patients. And then in terms of treatment for mild COVID-19, the treatment that the Department of Health advocates is symptomatic treatment using paracetamol uh, in, uh, as, a, as an option for pain, uh, advise patient on adequate hydration, uh, do not use corticosteroids in mild COVID-19 uh, disease, and when treating mild COVID-19, there's no clear evidence that there's any use with using any of the other mentioned therapies. So importantly, when you identify a high-risk patient, we should advise patients to check their respiratory rate and difficulty of breathing, their temperature, their pulse, their mental state. Well, they, that'll probably be, have to be done by a member of the family. And pulse oximetry is a useful, is a useful advent to home monitoring of patients. So some of the questions you need to ask yourself when you see this patient in the outpatient setting what investigations would you would you do? So some people have, have, have uh, there's some guidelines would recommended a whole lot of investigations to to measure inflammatory markers that has been not shown to be of, be of any benefit in patients like this. You would do the investigations that is associated with his chronic uh, disease management. What advice you should give him uh, in terms of monitoring himself at home and uh, uh, how to manage his, his chronic conditions. So, and when he should return, if, if he needs to return and monitoring at home. So we have a, a regular column or a, a regular article in the South African Family Practice Journal called Mastering Your Pe Fellowship. And uh, a few colleagues and myself from various universities in the country, we publish this for our registrars. And one of the, one of the items in this is the critical appraisal of quantitative research. And we, we, we give you an article to evaluate, to read, and then we ask a whole lot of questions. So if you, if you 
are interested in evidence-based medicine, I would highly recommend that you look at it because we use all forms of methods, including the qualitative design to actually um, pique your interest in, in terms of how to go about critically appraising uh, a research article. So this is just an, uh, uh, an algorithm from the uh, National Health Service of England, where it actually uh, uh, follows on how you go about monitoring patients at home in terms of pulse oximetry. Uh, this was a publication which showed that there is benefit in uh, monitoring vulnerable groups and the vulnerable groups that they, they in, in particularly were interested in, particular were interested in those that were old and those with multiple comorbidities. Uh, and then the, 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 the guideline from the WHO was that for symptomatic patients with COVID-19 and risk factors for progression to severe disease who are not hospitalized, we suggest that the use of pulse oximetry monitoring at home as part of a package of care include pa patient and provider education and appropriate follow-up. Now, this was a conditional recommendation with very low certainty evidence. So they've made that recommendation. So I think our panel will talk about certainty of evidence as well in the, in the, in the discussion. So existing evidence suggests that cause that will benefit most from uh, pulse oximetry at home as a diagnosis of COVID-19, either clinically or positive test result, and also symptomatic, and they're either age 65 years or older or under 65 would, and, ex and considered extremely vulnerable. So those are the ones with comorbidities. So uh, this was also done in, in, as part of a NICE review where they looked at vitamin D. And uh, I know that lots of us tended to prescribe vitamin D and I'm also guilty of it early on in the pandemic because we didn't know any better. And we were using data from an old study that used vitamin D in ICU patients, which showed better outcomes. So the, the review of this data from the, from the NHS and from, the, from NICE said, do not offer a vitamin D supplement to people solely to prevent COVID-19, except if they are part of a clinical trial. And do not offer vitamin D supplement to people solely to treat COVID-19, except as part of a clinical trial. So not for treatment, not for prevention. We had this other publication, uh, this, this, this meta-analysis that was done by our colleagues from the National Department of Health, where they looked at vitamin C for SARS-CoV infection. And they looked at a whole lot of studies and they came up with the summary statistic in the form of a forest plot. And what you need to take note of is in the, once they put all the all the data together. And you can see most of the trials tend to cross the line of no effect. So this line in the center is the line of no effect. And when your confidence interval cross the, the line of no effect, then that it means that the data from that study is not statistically significant. And when the summary statistic was provided, it actually crossed the, the line of no effect. Hence, there was no a statistical significance in using vitamin D either for mild or severe infections, but you will see it in a lot of local protocols. Uh, this was about inhaled corticosteroids in ambulatory and hospital patients with COVID-19. And again, this received a lot of attention both in social media and in the scientific literature. But when the, the literature was reviewed, there's the, 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 the NMLC COVID-19 subcommittee suggested that inhaled corticosteroids not be used routinely in ambulate or hospitalized patients with COVID-19, not requiring oxygen therapy unless indicated for other reasons like asthma, like COPD, et cetera. So uh, the evidence currently does not recommend us using inhaled corticosteroids. So this was ivermectin and no, ivermectin, there's big advocacy groups for ivermectin uh, and um, I think some groups even took uh, certain departments to 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 uh, take SAPRA to to court, etc. But ivermectin, when used for moderate disease, has actually shown to have no effect. As I've explained, if you look at this forest plot uh, and in your summary statistics, there is no significant effect in terms of preventing mortality. Uh, and when it was studied in uh, patients who, in terms of clinical worsening, up to Day 28, no significance. Um, and then when it was looked for clinical work and worsening up to 14 days, again, no significance. So we can't really support the use of ivermectin 
in routine care for patients because remember ivermectin is also associated with side effects so as a ethical family practitioner or ethical primary care provider you have to be provide no harm to the patient when you are treating them uh, so the the other medicine that was actually uh, assessed was the use of azithromycin, because we know that azithromycin has sometimes been advocated as, as contributing to its anti-inflammatory function uh, in, in COVID-19. And again, no evidence was found. You, these reviews are available on the Department of Health website, uh, and the website is actually mentioned at the bottom here. So you're welcome to go and have a look at the entire guideline. Now, what I'm doing is just providing a summary of the recommendation from the experts panel that actually reviewed the data. Uh, so this we looked at uh, a meta-analysis. This was done an independent meta, looked at all-cause mortality or asymptomatic with mild disease, uh, the clinical benefit of harm. Uh, and this was uh, uh, based on colchicine. So that was another drug that was used in outpatient setting. And again, the summary statistics showed no evidence for its use. Uh, this is about use of oral steroids or uh, intravenous steroids for, first of all, all participants. And this was from the recovery trial, which showed benefit in that sense. But when the subgroup analysis was done, it showed that there are actually no benefit in patients who have mild disease not requiring oxygen. This was further analyzed in another uh, meta-analysis. And now we have actually uh, clear guidance in terms in patients requiring oxygen, there is a statistically significant improvement if you use oxygen for those group of patients. And in patients not uh, requiring oxygen, there is a tendency to harm in those patients. So I think uh, if, you, if you look at these in the, se in the second graph at the bottom, uh, where you would be hesitant to actually prescribe steroids, oral or intravenous or intramuscular in patients with mild disease not requiring oxygen. So thank you. I think I'll handle the questions uh, later on when we come to the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Naidu, for taking us through uh, the, the main issues around case management of COVID. Uh, it is very important. Uh, we need to, uh, to discuss this. And, and I'll invite the colleagues on the chat to, on the, on the call to, uh, register the questions so that we, we we take this during discussion. If you prefer to, you know, tell us your questions to to ask the question directly, we, we can make provision for that also. But time is limited, so Q and A chat will probably be the best option. Now, the the next presentation uh, by Dr. Jeremy Nell will be looking at anticoagulation in patients with. Uh, COVID-19. Uh, so I'll ask uh, Jeremy to take us through the next presentation. Over to you, Jeremy. Uh, thanks, Dr. Jake. I'm just going to uh, give me 10 seconds to share the slides. OK. All right, great. Thank, uh, thanks very much. Sorry, I'm just muting myself. There we are. So, um, so welcome very much. Uh, welcome and thanks very much. Um, I'm going to just talk about anticoagulation specifically in patients with COVID-19. So the case itself is a 35-year-old woman who arrives at your practice uh, complaining of three days progressive dyspnea, cough, and myalgia. Symptoms which will bore you to tears at this point because it's always COVID. It feels like in the middle of a wave. Um, room air oxygen saturation is 90%. And therefore, because of this, is, this patient is hypoxic, and therefore there's a, a kind of different treatment algorithm that occurs when, that, when that's the case. 
Um, her blood pressure is normal. Her bloods are normal apart from platelets, which are a little bit low of 117, and the D dimers up of 2.14. And just to be clear, this is not, not recommended to do things necessarily like D dimers, certainly not for every patient uh, who you see with COVID, but these are done and these are the results in front of you. Rapid COVID test is positive, uh, and you decide she needs admission. And I think you're right there because the oxygen saturation is low. This is someone who ideally should be managed in a hospital setting. Let's see if we can get this advanced. There we are. All right. So do you need to confirm the diagnosis with a PCR test? And just think of the answer just for a second. The answer, of course, is no, but I just wanted to make sure because this is a current and continual form of confusion. Um, if a rapid test is perfectly good to rely on, certainly if they're positive, um, and when the pretest probability is high. So in other words, if someone's symptomatic like this, if they're in the middle of a wave, or they're a contact of a case, for example, these are really not tests that you need to worry about when they are positive. A positive test can be taken to indicate um, that this is indeed COVID. A negative test is a little bit different because we know that the rapid tests are not as sensitive, so they don't pick up as much COVID, certainly at the lower viral loads than a PCR test. But a positive test, you can pretty much trust, certainly when there's um, some expectation that this may be COVID to go in with. Now that the patient is admitted, do they need anticoagulation? So just think for a second again. So yes, so in general, this really applies, and, and this is not specific to COVID, this applies to most hospitalized patients, uh, certainly those who have risk factors for stasis or severe disease, we know though that COVID also is associated with more venous and arterial thromboses than you would normally see for other infections. Um, and so there is a risk, there's a sort of thrombophilic uh, element to COVID with both the venous and arterial systems, which we would want to add a degree at least of anticoagulation to. So they certainly need prophylactic anticoagulation. The question is what sort of dose are we going to use? So this is, we're now using enoxaparin, um, goes by the brand name sometimes of Clexin, but uh, what, what dose are you going to try and use? And really, if you're using the, a low molecular weight heparin, which is really the question, the key issue is what dose to use in the setting. So for this, again, it's helpful here to consult the evidence. This is from um, a, this graph actually is from a lovely website called COVID NMA, which looks at all the randomized controlled trials involved in COVID in across almost every therapeutic conceivable. And piles them together so that they're all in one place and you can actually produce um, these, what they call forest plots from them. This is in the, uh, the, the NEMLEC COVID-19 Ministerial Advisory Committee's report on, on uh, anticoagulation, but really what you're looking at here is therapeutic versus prophylactic dose. So if you look here as the mouse over here, anything on this side of this vertical line, so here's the vertical line, anything on the left of it, favors intervention one, which is therapeutic clexane, anything on the right, um, of that line favors prophylactic dose clexane. The confidence intervals, which are the range of results in the real world, which we think um, the study might be reflective of, is there in, on the width. And you can see these lines that go, oh, where's my mouse gone? There we are. Uh, lines, for example, here's the point estimate, but the confidence intervals here to here. So in other words, we can be reasonably sure that the true answer, at least in this study, lied, but lay between here and here. Um, but if you can see, if you pile them together, if you look at the mixed population here in blue, which is the summary, you're really looking at an answer which goes quite comfortably on both sides of that line. Uh, and if you look at just specifically at the critical, uh, critically ill population, it again goes happily on both sides of the line. It really suggests, if you look right at the bottom there, that um, we can't at all be certain if one has a, a clear benefit on the other. And this is in terms of mortality. So we're looking at mortality at 21, 28 days, no clear evidence of benefit to using the higher dose versus uh, the lower dose. What if you use intermediate dosing versus the prophylactic dosing? So again, this is a sort of halfway point where you, you might use not quite therapeutic, but maybe somewhere in between prophylaxis and therapeutic. And again, you can see these answers that clearly line up nicely on the vertical there, suggesting again, at least from the randomized control evidence, that we don't um, see any clear benefits to anything higher than prophylactic dosing. Um, we do know that's mortality again. We do know um, that they do it does work in terms of reducing major thrombobolic events. In other words, if we give higher doses, therapeutic doses, we do prevent a few strokes, a few heart attacks, a few pulmonary emboli. And you can see here this graph clearly shows benefit on you can see most of those figures falling on the left of the line favoring the higher dose. 
So if that's the case, why are we being stubborn and saying we don't recommend anything higher than a prophylactic dose? Well, the answer is that they also cause a lot more bleeding. So if you look at major bleeding, so this is potentially life-threatening bleeding, um, if you look, the best is probably just right at the bottom there where it's all piled together. There's certainly a suggestion, it does just cross one there, um, so you can't be entirely sure, but there's certainly a suggestion that this causes more bleeding. And, and if, in fact, if you look at the mild to moderate um, group, this is now, it doesn't actually cross one, so you're going to be slightly more sure, but ultimately this is a, a, a signal here which suggests that you have more major bleeds. And this is a very plausible signal, of course, because we're giving higher doses of anticoagulation. And we think, I mean, why it doesn't seem to have an effect on mortality, even though it does prevent maybe some strokes and heart attacks, is probably this, that what you gain in terms of reducing major thromboembolic events, you lose in terms of causing more major bleeds, and those sort of balance each other out. So other issues which may come to the, about this patient is do you continue the anticoagulation after discharge? And it's worthwhile thinking about this just for a second before I show what we recommend the answer to be. So this is from our, our uh, national guidelines so saying we really don't recommend continuing it after discharge because of a number of things. One is that we think you're probably over the worst anyway if you're going home. Um, we also, if you do have a major bleed, a major bleed outside hospital is potentially life-threatening, much more so than when it occurs in hospital. So in other words, the risks are probably higher if you're doing this after discharge and the benefits may be lower. We don't know that there's not a lot of evidence in this setting, um, but also the other issue to consider is that the trials generally stopped it after 14 days and didn't continue them, certainly as outpatients. So the trials really were limited to inpatients, really the only point we have evidence for. So we don't recommend it really. But again, if a trial comes that suggests something totally different, this is an opportunity to revise it because we have a low certainty in this recommendation. But that is, I think, a sensible recommendation based on no clear evidence of benefit, but certainly the possibility, at least, of worse outcomes afterwards. What about giving anticoagulation for those who don't need admission in the first place? So, so you have someone who's got mild disease, they don't require hospitalization. Should they be anticoagulated? And we've seen lots of so-called protocols going around. Um, our suggestion from the National Department of Health side is that, again, not to recommend anticoagulants or antiplatelet agents for outpatients. Um, and really, again, that's primarily due to a lack of evidence to support any benefit. But it's a really important point to get right, though, that when you're giving anything to a patient who has mild disease, in other words, who doesn't yet require hospitalization or doesn't require hospitalization at all, you're really dealing with a subset of people of whom the massive majority, well in excess probably of 95% of such people, won't require anything and will get better by themselves. So you really don't have much scope to make a big improvement here because we know that most people with mild disease do not need hospitalization ever and then go, al go along to recover fully. And when that's the case, to give anticoagulation, which might be risky, your, the chances of having a greater risk than benefit here are quite high. And again, this is something where there's not a lot of evidence, but I think there's good reasons not to give, considering the very small potential benefit you could even possibly see given that most people get better anyway, and the potential for quite large risks in terms of major bleeds that occur for anyone um, outside of, of a hospital setting. And then just finally to end off uh, and to change check just a little bit, if you recall that platelets, the platelet count of the patient there was 117, um, and he had recently returned from Mozambique, it turns out. His rapid malaria test is positive. Did you forget to think about malaria? And I bet you did. But... Um, Please don't, and there's a bouncy mosquito to remind you of that. Um, this is a, an issue we have seen. It's clearly not a very common issue, but around, around malaria season, which it is now um, in the summer, warmer months, it's certainly in parts of the country which abut the malaria areas or where there's travel to uh, Mozambique or any other similar malaria area in any part of the country. Um, we do see this occurring, and it can be quite difficult to tell them apart, actually, because remember, COVID may be asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic, and the symptoms of malaria may actually mask the symptoms or at least mimic the symptoms of COVID-19. That's a fairly dense slide, but really to look and say that really a lot of the symptoms on the left and the right are common. Both patients will have myalgias, fevers, fatigues, headaches, for example. You probably won't get loss of smell and taste and things like that in, in malaria. That's more COVID. But you can, for example, get what looks like a COVID pneumonia if you have ARDS from severe malaria. So it's something just to please keep considering, uh, especially around malaria season where it is now. And we have had cases of people dying because their malaria went undiagnosed 
when they were treated for COVID because it was COVID season and the, and the test was positive. So please do remember as well to consider malaria in the appropriate patients. Anyone really with a low plated count, especially someone who lives next to a malaria area or who's traveled to a malaria area. But even occasionally we see it outside of those uh, markers on history. So it's something worth considering and really easy and cheap to test and can be life-saving at occasion. Um, and I'm gonna leave it then and, and hand back to the next speaker. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jeremy Nell. That, that, that's really uh, wonderful. I think um, you've also saved us a few minutes. So we can take five minute discussion before we take the, the last presentation. There, there are two questions in the uh, Q&A chat. I see Prof. Naidu had already responded, but maybe it would be good to, to discuss it quickly in terms of the role of antigen tests, uh, given the shortened incubation uh, period. And, and maybe there's also a question for you, uh, Jeremy, around the, the use of aspirin. Can we start with the uh, antigen tests, Prof. Naidu? Okay, thank you. Uh, so the, the antigen test, we still use it, especially in the settings of pre-procedure, uh, when we need to get an urgent CT scan on the patient or we need to ad admit patients and manage risk, but we don't take it as, you know, as highly sensitive. So if it is negative, we still do the PCR on our patients. Uh, so with Omicron, we found that the, the positivity rates from the, 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 sort of the, dis the disparity between our antigen tests and our PCR tests was much more than the previous variants. So I'm not too sure if the incubation period has any effect on the antigen test per se, but we've just found that the Omicron is probably, uh, the, the, the antigen test for Omicron uh, yields a less sensitive result. That means more false negatives. So I don't know if uh, Dr. Nell wants to add. Um, it's interesting yeah, it's interesting you say that. I, I know that did, we're quite interested early on in looking at the rapid test. The validation from uh, the NICD and the uh, and, and others suggested probably similar rates of sensitivity, so no big reason to worry. But I do think one of the issues, as you said, is is um, about the timing of it. So it's not it's not so much as the question says about the shortened incubation period that that's the worry. Um, in fact, this has at least as high viral load and potentially even higher. One of the questions that came is whether the posterior nasopharynx was still the better site because uh, it, the, the if cells of the infect are slightly different and there are some, some studies that suggest oral swabbing might even be better than nasopharyngeal. But at the moment, we really recommend doing more or less what you did before. Rapid tests still have a very good place uh, because they're going to be very good at finding the infectious people. We know they're not as great with very low viral loads, but missing people with very low viral loads is not particularly relevant if it's not going to be transmissible. So. Yeah, I think I think the rapid tests still have a, an important role to play in the right setting, um, and and but it is a it is a good point that each variant they do need to be reassessed each time just to check what's happening. Are, is the sensitivity falling off or not? At the moment, probably okay, but but it's something to consider for each wave. Unfortunately, it keeps the lab people busy. Thanks. All right, thank you. And then uh, from Prof uh, Tamara Credo. The use of aspirin, where is the evidence for, for this? Hi, hi, I was actually meant to type this, but happy to talk about it too. <laughs> I yes. just hit the wrong button. Um, hi, everyone. It's great to be here with you. And I'm, I'm learning a lot from, from Mergen and, and Jeremy. Thanks. Um, just with aspirin, it's one of those rare cases in COVID where you have a massive trial of almost 15,000 people. Um, it was one of those big platform trials that was in the UK and Nepal and Indonesia and a few different places. And it was actually very clear from there that there was an absolutely equal, there was no benefit, um, no effect for, for clean, clinical improvement and mortality. It just didn't make a difference at all. So that's one where we actually have a pretty clear answer for similar to steroids in hospitalized patients needing oxygen. Um, so I guess that's a, that's a neat one. Um, to, to respond to. Thanks. There's also a question on the use of antihistamines. Um, I, I can, I, sorry, I haven't, haven't seen the question, but uh, in general, no, I've seen no evidence that they help. So I would stay away from it again. And I do think again, all of these, all of these medicines have potential downsides. So I, the, 
bias to me is always in favor of we, we needing good evidence to give it rather than uh, and you know waiting for that to come in certainly haven't seen any good evidence for it and, and i wouldn't personally use it you know if symptomatically you can take what what you need to for it and if, if that's going to help you there it would but there's usually simpler ways to do it um i don't know if any of the other panelists have other comments they want to add to that yeah, so so I think I yes. think there was a was a primary care doctor in KZN who was advocating for the use of antihistamines, but we've got we've seen no evidence for its use. Uh, I think you if if you really convicted convinced that it works, the best way to test it is in a clinical trial. And I think what we need to do, and it's, it's a discussion that we've been having in Sama, is to actually capacitate private practitioners to do to do clinical trials and use patients in their practice. Because I think we can, we, we had a discussion last year with a whole lot of, I think a few GPs joined us when we did a session on, on uh, developing your pro research proposal. And some of them have showed interest in doing research in, pri in the private sector. So if you feel convinced that something is really working and you've got anecdotal evidence that it does, I think the best way to do it is to link up with, with SAMA perhaps or another academic institution and actually test it. And then it doesn't become just yes, a, it actually becomes evidence. Thanks. No, no, I fully agree with you. I think that's something that the uh, Department of Health supports. Um, it to be even better that you, you get collaboration between uh, state facilities and private facilities that will uh, go a long way in, in improving, you know, collaboration, patient outcomes and everything. So we can uh, take that up. I was discussing with colleagues in Limpopo uh, last year when I was there. I noticed that there's no clinical trial there. There's no compassionate use program. And people have a lot of ideas. There. So the best way is to test these ideas in, in a context that, that is uh, appropriate for that. So th thank you so much for, for proposing that. Now, colleagues, I see there are a lot of questions. Can we quickly take the presentation on, on pediatrics, and then we'll do the discussion on pediatrics, and we come back to, to the first two presentations. So I'll hand over to uh, Professor Klute to take us to children are very important. So we're really listening with a lot of attention. Over to you, Prof. Good evening. and. Um... Thank you for giving me the opportunity to <clears throat> talk about COVID-19 in children. Um, I am going to give you a more practical approach to different ways children present with COVID as the symptomology is not always as um, clear as an adult. So I thought we will discuss that a bit. Um, so without further ado, let's look at um, case one. So case one is an eight-month-old baby that presents to a GP practice um, with a mother complaining that the baby had a fever and a cough for four days. The patient has fever, um, respiratory rate is 45. It's not really very high for an eight-month-old. It's slightly raised. Heart rate is raised. It's 140, but it's not um, so bad that you would be concerned, and the baby has a blocked nose, but is still able to feed. And when you examine the patient, there's mild respiratory distress, some secretions in the chest, no wheezing, no hyperinflation. So I'm sure you're used to seeing this um, in, in other seasons, but if you assess this patient's current condition, would you say, if you think for yourself, this patient is stable, will be able to be sent home with a mom, is unstable, need to be referred to the pediatrician, or would you say this patient is unstable and need to be referred <clears throat> for hospitalization? And the correct answer is actually the patient is stable. It can be discharged with the mother, provided that you teach the mother how to safely look after the child and when she should be able to come back. The second thing I wanted to discuss, and that is the, the challenge in children. What, what would your possible differential diagnosis be for this particular patient? As if it's not in a current COVID wave, 19 wave in your area, you would most probably consider other viral infections and you would treat it symptomatically. 
Um, if it is in a current COVID-19 wave in your area, you should always consider it should change your differential diagnosis for the patient. However, in pediatric patients, there has been studies showing um, that there is, can be co-infections with organisms. So you can have COVID-19 infection plus human metanema virus plus an RSV virus. Um, so there can be co-infections between the two. But on further history, if you take a further history, and in, in, in infants specifically, the history is quite important, so you won't always test infants. Um, the mom tells you that the sibling at home is ill, <coughs> tested SARS COV positive three days ago, and she also now informs Sorry, you. Sorry, yes. Luther. Yes. Um, Sorry, there's a lot of feedback from your side. I don't know if there's anything. Um, Right. Like, is this it's like an interference on the mic. Yeah, yeah. Is that Thank better? Okay. Yeah, sorry for that. No, that's okay. Thanks. So, um, on further, it was probably because I speak very loud <laughs> and I get excited. On further inquiry, the mother also tells you now, yes, she understands the patient is stable and can be discharged home, but this baby is an ex prem infant and she's very worried. She wants to know how does this how is there anything else she must do for her baby or shouldn't you refer the patient just because it's an ex premature infant? So if you think about it, does the comorbid, does the additional other factors, risk factors, possibly there or not, they would that change your management plan? So first of all, let's agree there's a high possibility that this baby can have COVID-19 due to the fact that he had exposure at home, oh. due to the fact that he had exposure at home, as well as the, the history of the cough with a fever. Um, and so you, can, you should definitely consider it as your diagnosis. And this child, if necessary, needs it, if he needs admission, would need to be swapped. But I thought I will show you what oh, for, for you, if you see a patient in your practice, what are the risk factors for severe COVID-19 infection in children? This includes infants less than a year of age, um, ex-premature infants, they've got a higher risk to get COVID pneumonia and might need admission for other reasons, and uh, older patients with comorbidity, specifically diabetes, asthma, and other chronic illnesses like chronic renal, chronic renal conditions and chronic cardiac conditions. So this patient of ours, definitely is an infant less than a year, is definitely an ex premature infant. But if you assess the patient, if we look at this patient, see if I can get my, the patient does have a fever, is still able to feed, doesn't have severe respiratory distress. And what I didn't tell you is the saturation for this patient is 94%. Therefore, this patient at the moment doesn't really need admission has no risk factors for um, severe disease and has no risk factors at the moment that the patient needs admission. Which other risk factors should you be looking for? Sorry, uh, I wanted to show you my apologies for that. Um, other risk factors you need to look for would be if the patient has a fever that does not come down, if the patient develops seizures, it's on one of my latest slides, I apologize if the patient has seizures, and if the patient um, has vomiting and is unable to um, keep in any food. If this occurs, then the patient should come back either to see you or should be escalated to go to a hospital to emergency room to be admitted. Right, now we have decided, um, hopefully everyone is happy, the patient doesn't need admission. What should we do for management? And this is where the, in, in pediatric patients, I always say less is more and the younger the patient, even less is better. So by all means, supportive management should be the mainstay. Management of fever with paracetamol, we prefer that. Um, you are not necessarily um, ibuprofen. You can continue feeding normally and if necessary, you can give a nasal decongestion. With, um, Previous ways before Omicron, we didn't see such a upper respiratory tract um, 
signs um, as in from the Omicron wave. In Omicron wave, we saw more upper respiratory, upper respiratory tract infection and nasal congestion in infants. There is no evidence of any of the following. There's no evidence in the use of antibiotics. Um, there is no evidence for additional supplementation with vitamin with vitamins, zinc, selenium, and important, there's no there's no um, evidence to use cough mixtures or inhaled steroids in this particular patient. In obviously, in infants, ivermectin will not be an option, but there's no of there's no evidence that any of this would improve the outcome of your patient. So when should you consider referral either to a hospital or to another um, pediatrician? If the patient's got worsened respiratory effort, if he's unable to feed, as I said, vomiting, seizures, and if the saturation is less than 92. I just want to mention um, saturations in children, home oxygen pulse oximetry, we do not advise that as, um, as patients it's difficult with probes. Often the probes do not give you an accurate reading and does not give you an accurate set. So the mom will need to be taught the first four signs and saturations is something done in the hospital or in your rooms. So I want to just quickly present you another way children present, which is most probably less commonly known. It's a, so it's a seven-year-old child that presents with diarrhea and some vomiting common symptoms, but mother complains that she also had a very high fever yesterday. She's got a, she's got a quite significant fever of 39.8, respiratory rate not really included, increased heart rate slightly increased, mildly dehydrated, and the rest of the examination is completely normal. You do not find any other signs in this particular patient. So, if you think about what your current assessment is of this child, obviously you would think the child is clinically stable, um, is mildly dehydrated, and if you give the child oral rehydration and they can retain it, the child should be able to go home. What should you else should you consider? And yes, I know this is a, um, a COVID-19 talk, but of course, always other viruses, um, other bacterial diarrheal disease, but children in this particular age group, older than five, can often present with abdominal symptoms and not typical respiratory tract symptoms and um, a cough as in adults. So you should always consider it in a current wave. We have COVID-19 that it is possible that it might be COVID-19. The only other tip I wanted to give you is we saw quite an increase in the incidence of new onset diabetes. So if you have a child that presents like this in your practice, it's good practice just to check the glucose, specifically if the child has abdominal pain and vomiting, to exclude diabetes and do a urine, just test the urine dipsticks for ketones in the urine. And you should always um, consider COVID-19 in children that present with acute gastro while we are in a current wave in your particular area. What about management? Once again, um, older child, but in our particular management is supportive management, manage the fever, continue to feed normally, start oral hydration. No antibiotics, including azithromycin, no evidence for other additional supplementation is necessary. It's poor, peer supportive management. When should you consider referral? Referral is necessary when the child's obviously vomiting, not retaining any fluids, but might need intravenous fluids. Um, quite importantly, in the from Omicron wave, we saw children with significant high fever and seizures associated with fever. Um, if the child has seizures um, and fever that is not responding to therapy, you should also tell, you should also refer the patient or tell the mom to go. Um, to, for assessment. And of course, if the HFT is high, it might be a possible new onset of a diabetic, a type 1 diabetic. And that was short and sweet. I didn't put um, our guidelines on because the guidelines will be published on the Department of Health website soon, the new pediatric guidelines. Thank you. All right.
Thank you. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, Prof, for such a wonderful presentation. Um, I don't see any hand. Uh, if, if there are colleagues who want to discuss the pediatric management of COVID, please raise your hand. You'll be uh, recognized or, or put your question in the Q&A chat. I see there's one question. No, no, someone send in their details. Um, but my, my, my question to you is, is um, to, <clears throat> I want you to, to tell us what is different as to uh, compared to management in adults. I, I want to look at the use of drugs. Um, are we using the same as in adults? Are there differences? I think the audience might benefit to, to hear what is different in pediatric or, or if it's still the same, you know, can, can we take us through that? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, in pediatrics, we, um, do not use um, drugs as most children have mild to moderate disease. Um, we, in general, give supportive management and supportive treatment. So that would be oxygen therapy, fluid therapy. If um, children with the increased risk of mild, children that we think might have multi-system inflammatory syndrome, which Prof. McCulloch will be discussing in two weeks' time, um, for them, we do opt to give additional um, therapy because that's an autoimmune phenomenon post-COVID post related, COVID related. And then we do give um, children that get severe COVID that's got comorbidities, we do, if their D-dimers are high, give them prophylactic anticoagulation as an additional extra. But other than that, we um, do not give... Um, we, we, we mainly treat symptomatically in pediatrics. So that's not much different from mild to moderate disease, I think, in adults, where most evidence shows there isn't additional benefit. Okay, and, and, and should we, um, th there's a question here, should all infants with mild symptoms be tested? I don't think so. I think number one, the, if, if it's in a clear way, the child is, is not going to be admitted and there is already a contact at home. For me, it makes sense the child's going to isolate with the parent at home, shouldn't be separated from the parents. And if you teach the mom well which warning signs to look for, it should be safe to send the infant home. The chances and the risk for the infant having COVID will be very high um, as if it's in the home environment. However, if the infant is sick and needs to be referred, then it's worthwhile getting tested. And if I may, although it wasn't asked, um, I would just like to say sometimes antigen testing in children is less sensitive than in adults. So a negative antigen test in a child does not necessarily exclude COVID. Um, so, I, but I do not think it's necessary to test all infants. Okay, I think the last one is a comment. I'm not sure. I can answer the one question. Okay. I'll type the answers to the question. Can I, if I may, can I answer the seven-year-old question? Yes, go ahead. So look for causative organisms. In the, yes. the seven-year-old, if there is no dysenteric type of stools, if it is um, just watery stools um, with the abdominal, the important thing is the abdominal pain with the diarrhea, then I would see a risk, then I would really consider COVID. If it is just um, normal watery stools and diarrhea without the, the additional abdominal pain, I wouldn't necessarily check for COVID. I would consider other causes um, for the diarrheal disease. Okay. No, th thank you so much, Prof. I see there are more questions, but maybe I'll invite you to uh, to respond in, in writing. And then in the meantime, uh, I will ask um, the uh, previous presenters to, um, to, to comment a little bit, give us uh, uh, 
you know, closing remarks in relation with your, your presentations. Uh, I'll start with Prof. Uh, Naidu, Dr. Jeremy Nell, and then give you a chance, uh, Prof. Prute, again, to, to give your closing messages. And then we'll ask Prof. Andy Parish as a NEMLEC chair to, to wrap up in terms of, um, you know, matching orders on behalf of Department of Health. I think that's important to the end. To, to talk about the new kid on the block, Barry Sitinib, and, and a short list of what is recommended, uh, what are the recommended interventions given the evidence available. And after that, I'll hand over to Dr. Klapo to end the session. We're aiming to finish at half past eight. And uh, we, so we begin the closing session, which is going to take 25 minutes. But uh, let me ask Prof. Uh, Megan Naidu to, to take us through um, the summary of what you presented and whatever interesting questions you've been responding to, uh, you know, what you need to escalate to the entire group. Over to you, Prof. Naidu. Uh, okay, thank you. I sort of lost my signal there as I moved over to a different modem. Yes, so uh, lots of interesting questions. So. I think the key area that people need to be aware of is the when 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 prescribing we need to base our prescribing habits or our management habits based on evidence and it's important that as as lifelong learners that we actually focus on developing skills into critically appraising uh, literature and what's available because if you subscribe to any of the journals you will be inundated with a host of publications. And on top of that, you have publications from sources that are not reputable, where we call these predatory journals, where people get published through a faster process and those journals make money from the publication fees that accrue. Uh, but it's not very good data, usually not good, it's good science, and it's usually uh, dubious peer review systems, et cetera. So you have to look at, first of all, the quality of the data that's being presented and have some idea of how to evaluate the, the, the data and, and then how applicable it is to your setting. Uh, so that's the first thing. Then the second thing is that lots of times, uh, most of the data that comes out of the scientific literature uh, is published in, in first world countries. So slowly, I think Africa is producing more uh, scientific literature and, um, and people are getting involved in big collaborations, et cetera, to generate new evidence. And, new, and that informs our, 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 our guidelines to practice. So lots of the guidelines, even if you look at, the, in the Department of Health, most of the guidelines are evidence-based. It means that before we actually decide to, to, to actually, um, um, prescribe or a uh, management option or suggest a management option, we look at the, the evidence behind that. And I think it's important as, as lifelong learners that we actually develop those skills in order to be able to critically evaluate the evidence on our own. The Emergency Medicine Guidance is an excellent app that you could look at acquiring because it gives you access to the Department of Health uh, resources and a whole lot of other resources. So locally, produce guideline and it actually is very relevant to our context in South Africa. So I would recommend that app uh, and it's extensively used uh, by the, the people in, in the Department of Health and, and clinicians practicing because it gives good linkages to the, to the Department of Health guidelines. So thank you very much. All right, thanks a lot. And I've used that uh, app uh, extensively. You, you don't have to pay for subscription fee, you know, and and we, we put in a lot of our materials there. There's also a knowledge hub, you know, that gives a lot of materials. Th thank you so much, Prof. From Dr. Jeremy Nell, any uh, closing remarks from you? Um, not, not particularly, but I just would like to thank, yeah, you know, Toronto Health and Summer and others for getting this platform up and going because it really is, one of the key things to get right, I think, in this epidemic is to move now, especially now that we have much more evidence than we did two years ago, 
is to use what we have to be as rational as we can and, and get the best possible answer therefore for our patients. So I think this sort of step, this sort of uh, forum is is most welcome and thanks to everyone for helping to organize it. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jeremy. And thank you for always responding yes to, to the call from the Department of Health. Very important. We, we can't uh, do these type of things without people like yourself, you know, on this panel. Very, very appreciated for all of you to be there. Um, let's hear um, from uh, Prof. Clute, Pediatrics. Um, is there anything you, you want to add from what you already presented? Uh, no, thanks for giving me the opportunity. I think um, COVID in children, the symptomology is not as clear as in adults always. So I would, uh, that's why I would like, I wanted to highlight that particular aspect. And then also that in children, um, symptomatic treatment is by far the mainstay of treatment and less dangerous than anything. I have nothing else right. to add. Thanks for the opportunity. Okay, thank you so much. And thank you for a wonderful uh, uh, presentation. Um, the other panelists that we have, Prof. Credo uh, from uh, Cochrane Center, is there anything you want to, uh, to say in addition to what you, you already uh, talked about? Maybe as you present, you can also answer to one of the questions that I have. Uh, there's so much uh, guidance out there, too many guidelines. Uh, what, what would you advise the clinicians on this call, you know, in terms of appraising uh, this guidance, this type of disinformation that, uh, mm -hmm. that they get? Of course, we know that if you're a family physician, first read what is published by family physicians, right? This is what I was taught a long time ago. Uh, when I studied family medicine, it may do that. But there are more, um, you know, um, that more things that, that you could um, talk. I, I see there's load shedding. I, I'm going to have to organize <laughs> <laughs> alternative light. I think that's how a lot of but us felt the past two years. Is we felt like Thank we were in the dark. Um, absolute information overload. And I must say, it's a huge privilege to be amongst all of you um, here and hearing your questions and your concerns and your considerations. Um, and, and exactly what you said about the information overload. We had information overload before just trying to keep up with practice and then COVID came along and really shone this torch on all the faults in our trying to understand evidence. And in parallel, we had all this, this wave of misinformation hitting us, which carries on and to sift through to work out what is fact and what not. I think it's very important to find credible sources. I don't know about you, but I don't have time to, to read and appraise every paper that comes up on COVID. So I'm very directed in the reviews that I do, but I do know where to look and I do know how to, um, I do know that the Department of Health rapid reviews, the guidelines that are coming through are increasingly credible, reliable, um, and try to keep up. But, um, and so there are a few great resources and I'd be happy to share some of those with people, the places to go to when you don't have time to appraise everything yourself. But of course, as clinicians, we have to try and keep our skills fresh and, um, and learn how to you know, decide, is this guideline credible or not? And I think if people have had those skills, it would have been a bit easier to, to see through some of the pseudoscience that, that came at us. Um, yeah, but it, just an honor to be together uh, in this and, and just respect and, and appreciation to all of you and to my panel, co-panelists, thanks. All right, thank you. Uh, th thank you so much. Uh, I see uh, I have a bit of light here, LED, and myself. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I think at this stage, I, I will ask Prof. Um, Andy Parrish to, to, to give us a, a short overview on the new kid on the block, uh, Paris City Nape. And also overview on what, what are the interventions um, that are recommended 
you know, every time I listen to experts around evidence for whatever we're doing for uh, COVID, I, I always count what is to be done and when to use what. And, and uh, I don't think we have more than five items <laughs> that are recommended. So can you take us through that, uh, Prof. Andy Parish? Yeah, no, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Jekka. I mean, I think it's great listening to um, everybody talk on these subjects, and it's um, always quite humbling to see where we've come from in terms of being able to answer so many of the questions that we couldn't um, two years ago. Um, there has been a thing called evidence evolution, which is that as we go from positions of almost complete ignorance about stuff where we're working from sort of basic science concepts of it may or may not work through to when you have robust um, controlled trials and large numbers of people being shoved into systematic reviews and you're getting sort of neat numbers at the end. It's a massive process and um, COVID has really brought out how fast this can be done. Um, I'm particularly humbled as a chair of this um, COVID uh, NEMLAC group where it's quite extraordinary the amount of work that's been done. I mean, some of these reviews, we have a sort of time frame for two weeks to do them, and they really are um, incredible bits of work that come out at really short notice. But what I want to say about that is that they're incredible bits of work. There's a lot of effort goes into it. The folk that do the review read all the trials. They'll read, have a look at the other observational stuff. They scratch their heads. They write the stuff down. It goes in a circle. People review it again. Everybody sort of hums and haws about it. And over that process, you have an enormous amount of input that has been put in in a very honest and robust way um, where we sort of tear a strip off each other if somebody's made a mistake and try and get to an honest answer. The end result of that is things that are of relatively high quality. And that's very different from somebody sitting down and saying, hmm, I think I'll write a review on COVID because, well, I feel like writing one and just sort of splurging it off the top of the head and popping a few articles out of the desk drawer that happen to be um, from their chummies. It's a completely different process. And the quality of the evidence needs to be looked at and that's something we need to do as modern clinicians we need to be able to not assess every single bit of evidence ourselves but see if the source that we're wanting to use is credible or not and I think that's really the um, thrust of what I wanted to um, what I was hoping we could achieve with these seminars is to try and get um, sort of a, a common feeling between practitioners in the country about what sh we should and shouldn't do in terms of uh, evidence sources. You know, the, the, I mean, I think that the key thing that struck me early in this thing was this business about, well, we don't know if it works, but it does, can't do any harm, so let's go ahead and give it a bang. Um, you know, as I, I, I took the, you know, a lot of us took exception to that. We feel very strongly that wasn't a clever position. And we, as time has gone on, it's become clear that there were real harms to that. For instance, the combination of chloroquine and azithromycin is giving hypoxic patients two QT prolonging drugs. And although we don't have robust evidence, it's quite conceivable that that combination actually increased mortality. Two drugs which on their own are, oh, well, worth a try um, on sort of biological principles actually might have killed people. And the same applies to ivermectin. You know, ivermectin, oh, it's, it's safe. It is safe if given as a deworming medicine to people who are otherwise well. Given to sick people who are terribly frightened and hypoxic and you know, I'm sure that this, now, this new drug, wonder drug, is going to fix them, can delay their arrival in hospital, um, can it make them insist on having um, you know, a treatment that actually may have um, caused harm in the sense that it's made them arrive at a time when they could have come earlier and done better. So a lot of those things are difficult to quantify. If you put somebody on a bunch of vitamins and um, particularly high dose vitamin C, for instance, and they're critically hypoxic and have to run off to the toilet every five minutes, you actually may find one or two deaths in the toilet. Nobody sees that as a vitamin C side effect. It's not counted by anybody. And that's the issue with controlled trials. They do um, quantify those things. And without that quantifiable data, it can be very, very difficult to know that something is safe. If something actually doesn't work, 
work and causes any harm, it is infinitely um, bad medicine in terms of the cost benefit ratio. Okay, so just in terms of those last two things, where are we with the drugs? So the reviews are all up on the Department of Health website if you want to get them. You can also get them from NICD. This is marginally quicker in terms of clickability. Um, essentially what we've got, as Dr. Njeko said, is a very limited number of things for which we have evidence of efficacy. So most of those reviews are saying, um, we don't think it works, don't bother to use it. Where we are, as we've said, um, corticosteroids in hypoxic patients, hospitalized patients, in patients who are not um, hypoxic, um, we don't have a clean signal, but the um, trend is towards harm, not benefit. So again, we don't advise to be used in our patients. Where we are with baricitinib, which is the new kid on the block, as Dr. Jack was saying, is that we have recommended its use. It uh, reduces mortality um, and uh, by about the same amount as corticosteroids. In fact, and that effect seems to be additive. Um, pricing much, much more expensive than corticosteroids. Accessibility is a problem. It's not equitably available in all the provinces, but it's, um, it's certainly worth a consideration, again, for hospitalized patients. Um, there's been some talk about molnupiravir, which is um, a orally available agent that we can be given to our patients. We haven't come down in favor of its use. The benefit um, was far lower than the initial headline um, uh, findings by the drug company when they pre presented it. So in general, um, we're sitting with steroids and baricitinib as the things we recommend, and that's about it at the moment. But it is really worth having a look at what we've put out there, and we urge you to start to look at how we assess the quality of guidelines. And, um, you know, it's become actually a, almost a science in its own right. It's a thing that has its own conferences and committees, and there's enormous number of tools up um, which look at how you work out whether a guideline is worth reading or not. And maybe those are the sort of things we can discuss in time to come. But overall, you know, I'm really delighted that we've been able to have this first meeting and started to introduce this um, concept of uh, marrying what's happening in SAMA and the private sector with what has been available in the public sector for some time now. So I'll leave it at that then. Thanks back to you, Dr. Njeg. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Prof, for, for the, uh, that conclusion. I think we, we're now very clear in terms of what to expect uh, to do. Uh, on my side, I would like just to um, uh, emphasize once more the issue of uh, collaborative research um, that, that was raised by Prof. Megan Naidu. That's something we need to follow up. If we look at private and public sector, uh, family physicians, uh, we need to uh, support such uh, uh, projects in future. If you don't have a lot of time uh, to, to appraise literature and all that, you need to know uh, that the summer source is reliable. We're working uh, together on this. Uh, National Department of Health guidance is reliable. Uh, it is, um, you know, the, the compiled by local expertise. So uh, it, it's really reliable, very important. Uh, before I hand over to Dr. Ntlapo, I'd like you, Prof. Andy Parish, to quickly say a word or two about remdesivir, evidence for use of remdesivir, and then evidence for use of home-based oxygen. Thanks, Dr. Jekka. So where we are with remdesivir, we're having another look at it. And in fact, in the light of new evidence that's been um, released, we are, have an original recommendation, which is up on the website, which is against its use because there was a very modest um, uh, evidence of benefit, if any. And um, it's new evidence is coming through. Um, we actually can have a meeting tomorrow where I think it will be discussed. So I, I'm not going to shoot myself in the foot about this, but um, I think we can watch that space, space. And as soon as we have an answer, we'll put it up on the website. Usually within a week or so of that meeting, that answer will be there as another review. So it shouldn't be too long a wait. Um, the, the other thing about um, home oximetry, I mean, I, I yeah, I think I just want to put a little perspective there. You know, there, there, there was a thing called a Swan-Gans catheter. 
um, which for years and years, everybody knew self-evidently was worth using in patients who were sick and in ICUs based on the fact that it was a new technology. It was um, something you could do for patients and it gave you numbers that you could read. The bottom line of it is that um, it took decades to actually uh, look hard at evidence for, for its benefits to patients. And um, the best one, I, I can't remember, it was Lance to B&J, but basically was a review um, to, entitled The Dying Swan, which effectively said that this technology, which had been used for decades, actually didn't improve any outcomes that were patient relevant. Now, the same problem comes with something like home oximetry. We just don't know yet. Um, there isn't, to my knowledge, a single randomized control trial that's been completed and has convincing evidence. The only one I've seen had 77 patients in it and proved nothing because they didn't randomize properly. So, you know, it's like all these things, it's evidence and evolution. You start off with a thing which seems plausible. They can't, anybody, you know, what harm can it do? And the harm it can do technically is it might again delay time to hospitalization. People might go, go to hospital earlier or later. I don't know. Only time will tell and hopefully some evidence. And that's really what we're appealing to is to say, well, you know, you can go either way when there's no evidence, but let's make sure that we do keep our eye open for the data. And once the data is in, we must have the humility and the agility, the intellectual agility to change track if what we thought was absolutely the best thing since sliced bread turns out to be wrong. And I think that, you know, dropping any intervention that you are particularly enamored of is a sign of a brilliant clinician if there is clear evidence of what you thought was right turns out to be wrong. But you have to have the humility and the patience to at least check in every now and then to see whether you're still correct or not. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Prof. Um, that's all from me. I'd like to hand over to Dr. Antlapo of SAMA. I uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Antlapo, for introducing me, uh, but also I uh, thank you for the collaboration that we've embarked upon. Uh, this is uh, going to be uh, a partnership. I, I call it a partnership with TIF because we're going to achieve a lot uh, together. Over to you, Dr. Nklapo. And goodbye from me. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Ndeka, uh, for a great job in facilitating this important uh, inaugural you know, event uh, that is co-hosted by ourselves. Let me thank the panelists as well uh, for highly insightful you know, presentations. I think there was a good marriage between uh, the background in terms of the academics behind what we do and uh, the clinical practice, which was well supported by evidence-based you know, studies you know, to, I think, guide the way that um, as you know, practitioners, we take care of our COVID uh, patients. Um, I'm sure that um, all colleagues have found something throughout the presentation that resonated with them either in terms of the way they practice or in terms of you know, something that they've always been wondering about. So let me thank uh, Dr. Njeka as well as the panelists for a highly informative session. As the SA Medical Association, Dr. Njeka, let me on behalf of everyone at SAMA express our gratitude um, with the partnership that we have established. As I indicated, this is the first of many um, you know, webinars that we'll be hosting together and other events uh, for that matter. We've already highlighted the event on the 17th. And um, I think going forward, we'll be looking at um, a year planner so that we have an ongoing uh, discussion about these things. And I think the real role that this will play is a seamless um, you know, clinical management between the public and private sector. And I think that's the importance um, of sharing this information on this platform. Um, in the presentation that Dr. Nell gave, um, he reminded us about uh, not forgetting my Dr. Njeka, I, I suspect that uh, Dr. Clark has got load shedding on his side as well. 
Yes, I think it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, and I still, I'm, I'm on my route. <laughs> so um, what do we do? Should we give him one minute or 30 seconds? Yeah, I think we can give him one minute. Um, let's see if he, if he gets back online again. Yeah, he probably uses his phone. Um, Dr. Njega, maybe while we're waiting for uh, Dr. Nathalpa to get back online, I just want to remind everybody that um, after we close this webinar session, there will be a survey um, and we just ask all, all the attendees to um, answer the questions on that survey. It'll be really helpful um, in evaluating um, whatever is needed for, for upcoming webinars. And um, yeah, so we just ask everybody to uh, keep an eye out for when the webinar is ended. There will be a survey uh, that pops up on your screen. Thank you. A participant going to get recordings of, of the session? Um, this session is recorded and all the recordings will be available on the SOMA website, on the podcast section, as well as the on the uh, SOMA YouTube channel. Okay, that's good. Um, Dr. Njeka, I think you can you can do all the closings from your side. Um, I think uh, Dr. Okay. Njeka is not going to go and come online now. Okay. All right. No, thank you so much, uh, colleagues. Uh, I think we this has come to an end. Uh, I thank you all for attending in such a large number uh, for an evening event. Um, we we are going to continue with this. Uh, the next session can, will be on the 17th of, of February uh, 2022. I expect uh, that you all join and uh, ask your other colleagues uh, who missed this session to, to come on board so that we could go through this. Uh, this is very important. We shared uh, three great presentations this evening. Uh, the first one from Prof. Uh, Megan Naidu was to look at major areas, key considerations in the management of COVID, clinical management I refer to. And then we got a presentation from Dr. Jeremy Nell on uh, the use of anticoagulations, uh, anticoagulant agents. And then we, we had consideration for pediatric management and we also got um, a lot of discussion around the evidence behind all the uh, recommendations. And um, I thank you for being part of this. This has come to an end. Uh, let's meet again on the 17th of February, 2022, same place, same time. You can now uh, go for dinner. You've earned yourself a dinner. It's been a long day. Goodbye. Don't forget to do the uh, questionnaire, uh, evaluation questionnaire before you, you go offline, please. Thank you.